Thank you, Matt, and thank you to Kathy Green and all the organizers for this fantastic conference. Um, our LTAR, Long-Term Agroecological Research Experiment, is what I call a teenager compared to Rodale's 30-year that you'll hear about tomorrow. And we did, I want to give credit to the other long-term sites that we visited to, um, before we established our site in Iowa, including the SAF site at UC Davis and the Rodale site in uh, Pennsylvania. So I'll give you some of our results from our first 13 years. Next. Okay. Um, you've heard about how much organic is increasing, and I just wanted to give some stats from Iowa. Uh, we have in the last, uh, in the NAS census, they picked up about 518 organic farmers farming about 106,000 acres. So in Kathy Green's um, chart there on the right, we're one of the dark states, which in this case is good. The darker the state, the more organic there is in the state. Um, and also OTA has a lot of statistics too, if, you, if you're not familiar with the website. And there's a couple of our organic farmers that I'll be talking about in a bit here. Um, I think it's important to t start with the farmers and um, revisit this study that Willie Lockeritz, one of the pioneers in organic research from Tufts University, conducted in 1984, asking farmers why they switched to organic. And I ran these um, stats by Dan Schwab, who's my grad student. He's also an organic farmer from South Dakota. And he said, absolutely, these resonate with him today, too that farmers believe they switch to organic because they think it's healthier for the farmer, their family, their livestock, it's more in harmony with nature, and they feel it's better for the soil and the environment. Um, Willie also found that in the farms that he surveyed, energy use was half on the organic farms compared to the conventional. So as you heard from Michelle, and you'll hear from others today and tomorrow, that's one thing we're very concerned with, looking at energy use and organic. So the first thing we did was sit down with our farmers in Iowa, travel around the state, sponsored by the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, and ask them, what do you want us to do for organic research? And one of the first things they came up with was to establish a long-term site where you could compare organic and conventional in the long term. And while a lot of people think we've moved beyond comparing organic and conventional in Iowa and conservative states, farmers want to know, can you make a living from organic? Will it yield the same as what I've been doing all my life? That is conventional. So that's why I think these long-term comparisons are important. Um, and yes, it's good to have all organic sites, but it's also important to maintain these uh, comparisons between organic, organic and conventional. And the farmers pretty much decided the rotations for the LTAR site. Ours is a 17-acre site in Greenfield, Iowa. Um, it, each each uh, block, you see there, each plot is a quarter acre. And so we use regular farm size equipment, similar to what Michelle showed at Beltsville. And uh, we have 44 plots representing four crop rotations, and included in those are five crops, or, yeah, five crops, so I'll go over those with you next. Um, as you've heard from John Reganold, and you'll hear from everybody, in the next two days, we do set it up um, using an organic approach, organic systems approach, so we utilize as much on-farm and local resources for nutrient supply, and that includes crop rotations, cover crops, and compost. We view the farm as a system with multiple plant pests, beneficial organisms interacting, Prevention is our number one method of dealing with pest issues. We use resistant or tolerant variety sanitation and allelopathy from that rye crop that Michelle mentioned. We also use that before our soybean crop. Uh, we believe that inherent biocontrols should be sufficient, as most organic farmers do. But when controls are warranted, least toxic um, approaches, NOP compliant materials can be used. So our rotations are very similar to Michelle's in that uh, we're looking at a conventional corn soybean. Uh, compares, compared to three organic rotations, um, and again, I didn't put the rye in there, but there's a rye crop before every organic soybean crop, so it's organic corn, rye, soybean, oat, alfalfa, organic corn, rye, soybean, oat, alfalfa, and then a second year of alfalfa, and then the shortest allowable certified organic rotation, which is similar to, uh, well, Michelle's got corn in his, but we do soybean, and then winter wheat with a frost seeding of red clover. And all crops and all rotations are grown annually, and there's four replications of each. Um, and we use, similar to Michelle's, local practices, uh, universe, Iowa State University recommendations for the conventional fertilization weed management uh, treatments. And then in the organic, we're using this swine hoop house compost to put about 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre just for the corn crop, and then 60 pounds an acre for the oat crop. So that's a pretty typical um, fertilization schedule for organic farms in Iowa. We're using the same varieties in conventional and organic, and you'll hear a little difference among um, our presenters for the next two days on this. 
Uh, I was told when I came, if you want to publish in the agronomy journal, you have to have the exact same variety, so that's what I went with. Uh, we use non-GMO in the conventional and organic in all the organic uh, crops and the rotations, as long as we can get organic seed. When we first began this trial, it was very difficult to obtain organic seed. That has since changed, which is really nice to see how much the organic seed industry has grown over this period. Um, yes, we do rely on tillage for our weed management, as is typical of the organic farmers in the area. Uh, so we'll use an average of two rotary hoeings and two row cultivations per season in the corn and soybeans. But we're mitigating that, as Michelle described at Meltsville too, with um, additions of organic matter through our crop rotations, particularly those small grains and legumes really help build up the organic matter. And we're using organic fertilization, the compost manure supplied to the corn and oats two out of four years, and two out of three year in the four-year rotation, two out of three years in the three-year rotation, similar to what Michelle showed. So it is a systems approach. We do have uh, many disciplines involved in this. I work with a host of scientists at Iowa State. And um, I won't be able to go over all these parameters today that we're measuring, but I will um, show you a little snippet. Mostly I'll talk about productivity and yields, but some snippets of soil quality, uh, grain quality, and a little bit on uh, beneficial insects, or sorry, insects and weeds. So these are our plots. And uh, we have a 30-foot border in between all the plots. It's a completely randomized design, which a lot of people are saying, well, why did you come up with that design? We felt it was really important to have the uh, conventional completely mixed in with the organic, so that when you come to the farm, you cannot tell which ones are the organic and which ones are the conventional plots. And um, it's, it's turned out to be pretty much that case, because I can't tell you right now, looking at it, if those are organic or conventional. Um, we, we had equivalent slope and soil types, which allowed for this completely randomized design. And um, in the third year, we were certified organic and have been certified since by the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. So a lot of data, and we're going to have this all in our proceedings. Um, Kathy's been great enough to get Crop Management Journal to uh, have proceedings from this conference, so you can visit all this data there. But basically, I'm showing, if you see NSD, that means no significant difference between the conventional and organic. And the only time the conventional was higher was in 1999. That's when we used a white corn variety. We since, since switched back to the yellow dent corn, which is predominantly used by organic farmers in the area. And then after um, 2008, we, start, we were able to use um, certified organic seed from Blue River in Kelly, Iowa. So a summary of our corn yields over 13 years, no significant difference between the conventional and organic rotations. Now there's a numerically, numerically greater yield with the um, longer rotation, and Michelle showed that too. So adding that, increasing the diversity, putting that perennial alfalfa for two years will definitely increase your yields. And um, you can see the county average there, 156. So we, we, we're doing really well at that site. So it's 169 conventional, 154 uh, three-year organic, and 162 four-year. So what do those yields match? They definitely match the uh, precipitation. And we had severe flooding in 2008 and 2010. I'm sure some of you saw us on CNN News uh, with the horrible flooding in 2010. And that definitely affected all yields in the state of Iowa. Soybeans have been unbelievably productive throughout the whole period, including the periods of flooding, which I'm amazed to see the resilience there. So um, in this case, sorry I meant to say, on the left is the white bar is the conventional, and then the yellow is the uh, three-year organic rotation, the orange is the four-year, and in this case we have a blue, which is the shortest uh, rotation, the two-year soybean. Start soybean rice, switch to soybean wheat. And no difference over the 13 years um, between conventional and organic. The conventional 47, organic three-year rotation, 49, four-year rotation, 50, and then the shortest one, you can see it is numerically less, it's not statistically less, but that is the problem with the two-year rotation, as Michelle pointed out too. Um, you're going to have lower yields in that rotation overall, 38 bushels an acre. And in this case, looking at the temporal variability across the 13 years, there are more um, cases of significantly greater uh, soybean yields in the organic rotations over the 13 years. Oat yields, uh, county average 63. Our average there at the Altar site has been about 97, 98 bushels an acre, and no, no difference between those two rotations. Alfalfa, county average 3.5, and our 12-year average is four tons per acre. So we're doing really well on that site. Wheat, uh, county average 48, and our eight-year average 
at the LTAR site is 50. Okay, moving just one slide on insects here. When we first started the site, there were no insect problems, but in the year 2000, we started noticing problems with this bean leaf beetle. And um, the problem with the bean leaf beetle, shown there on the left, is that it can transmit a virus, this bean pod malavirus, shown on the right, puckers the leaves, and it also can cause staining uh, complex to the soybeans themselves and open infection sites for other staining fungi, like that purple sarcospora shown there. So we began to monitor the uh, bean leaf beetle in 2000, and you can see the results of, of since 2000, 2010, no significant difference between the conventional and organic. Um, organic, 19.2 beetles per 20 sweeps compared to 13.4 in the conventional. So, and this is without pesticides. So it's, it's interesting to see that um, we're able to maintain the same type, type of populations in the as the conventional. Now down on the right, bottom right is the a lady beetle eating some soybean aphids and we did start monitoring for them in the last couple of years. I don't have that data here but I'll put it in the proceedings and um, in that case we are seeing more control of the aphid in the organic because I think of those uh, higher populations of the beneficial insects. The bean leaf beetle on the other hand has very few beneficial insects unlike the aphid. Okay weeds, I'm so glad Michelle went first because he gave exactly the same thing that we've been seeing. You're always going to have higher weeds in organic. You're not using herbicides. So the trend is the same. The bar on the left, the yellow bar is conventional, and then you have the organic rotations on the right. And that short, short rotation, the two-year rotation on the far right there has the highest variability in weed populations. Ironically, you get the same yield, but as Michelle pointed out, it is dangerous because you are increasing your uh, weed seed bank. So um, something to be concerned with. I'm not an advocate of the two-year rotation, which is basically what we wanted to promote through this research. Same thing Michelle pointed out, longer rotations, less weeds. You have that allelopathy from the, from the rye and also some from the alfalfa. You're changing the phenology, as Michelle pointed out, change your rooting patterns, going from shallow soybeans to deep rooted small grains. And you're also increasing weed predators with cover in the winter through your alfalfa. In this case, it's our uh, wheat clover rotation shown there. Okay, just a little two slides on food quality. Um, you heard this morning words like messy and not so clean as the yield data and the soil quality data that I'll present. And that's the, that we have been finding that the case. We're not finding any differences in food quality between the organic and conventional. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think we have a lot of other things to tout, such as uh, environmental quality that I'll pre be presenting next. But basically our soybean proteins um, conventional average 37, organic 37. Now you see again another problem with that shorter rotation. Statistically no difference, but 29% was about the average with that short rotation. So um, that's something else to be concerned with too, not short rotation. Corn, same thing, protein, which is what people look for the most. Um, averaging about 7.9 in the conventional and the organic, no significant difference over the 13 years. But this data also reflects the same as what Michelle showed, and this is from Cindy Camardella from USDA ARS National Lab for Ag and the Environment. It used to be called National Soil Tilt Lab. They changed the name last year. And um, she's been doing soil science out there for 13 years now, and she's showing soil quality higher in the organic system, including higher soil organic carbon, total nitrogen, particular organic matter carbon, microbial biomass carbon, and potentially mineralizable nitrogen same pattern that you heard from Michelle previously. She's also showing uh, greater cations in the organic system, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and um, lower acidity. You see the pH there, 6.7 in the organic compared to 6.4 in the conventional. Um, just one snippet of her uh, temporal variability in total nitrogen, total soil nitrogen. And she, there's a poster, um, excuse me, <clears throat> there's a poster downstairs, upstairs, um, that has all the details of the soil quality um, data. So I encourage you to look at it if you're interested in this. And what Cindy found is that the total nitrogen increased by 33% in the organic system, which was significantly greater than the conventional system. So her conclusion, after 12 years of organic matter management, higher soil quality in the organic systems, higher soil organic carbon, total nitrogen, biologically active not, uh, organic nitrogen, particulate organic matter carbon, higher P, K, M, G, and C, A, calcium, 
concentration is lower acidity. Organic soils have similar inorganic and similar to what Michelle was saying. We're really concerned about building up too much uh, nitrogen. Should create uh, problems with leaching. No problems there. Similar to the uh, conventional. Similar aggregate stability, which was interesting because in the beginning there was higher aggregate stability in the organic. And, and also bulk density was similar. Um, and she also sees enhanced soil function, greater nutrient use efficiency, more labile N and cations, but equal inorganic nitrogen. And then, same as Michelle, higher carbon sequestration potential in the organic system. Okay, just quickly, I know we're only supposed to talk about economic, I mean, uh, productivity, but unlike Michelle, I can't control myself. <laughs> I have to put in some economic, <coughs> excuse me, because it, the farmers in the audience are most interested in these slides. But it's always good to start with a comparator, and this is from Kathy Shop ERS, showing that with all, despite all the ups and downs, it's been basically a static um, income, net, in, net farm income from 98 to 2010, 99 to 2010. Compared to organic systems, uh, this is from Craig Chase, our ISU farm management specialist. He's been monitoring the economics out there at the Altar site for the last 13 years. And you can see over the last, um, five years. However, I'm just going to talk about 2010. In 2010, there, these, are, these are the production costs, excluding labor and land, $100 an acre, lower cost with organic. So that's really important, and John Reagan all mentioned that in the beginning too. It's not just the uh, returns, you also have to look at the production costs. And then the returns, um, similar. Organic returns were $100 an acre greater than conventional in 2010. And that's been pretty much the case all along that we've been getting about twice as high returns over the 13 years in the organic system. Um, Craig goes on to say conventional price and revenues are historically high. Fertilizer, pesticide, seed, fuel costs have increased dramatically, reducing net economic returns to conventional production. Organic is the classic risk reward situation. You assume additional individual crop production and marketing risk to receive higher average returns. And we'll hear more about this tomorrow. Just one slide on this because a lot of people are saying, well, where are you going to go in the future? We would love to develop an organic no-till system that works. Um, Jeff Moyer is going to present on this tomorrow. This is part of our USDA. It was, at that time, it was called IOP, Integrated Organic Program. It's now called OREI Project with um, six, five states and Rodale, six institutions where we're comparing organic no-till across the country. And you can see our yields are pretty decent with soybean, 36 to 45. Uh, corn, however, can't get those yields up. It's, real, it's a challenge, and Jeff hopefully will be addressing that tomorrow. Next steps, energy analysis, life cycle analysis, new rotations based on focus group input, which we're having on April 7. Um, I know they're going to push us to integrate livestock, a livestock component into the farm. You know the constraints with that, but I would love to do it. Uh, develop recommendations based on multiple benefits of organic production. In addition to optimal yields and economic returns, we're also going to be delving more into soil quality, Water quality, thanks to Mary Pete and her uh, program with water quality and organic. And also, um, we are very interested, as John Reginald is, in the social benefits of organic, the health of the organic sector. So I just want to end by thanking my organic farmers that I've been working with because they are the ground truthers behind this. They've shown that organic can be as high yielding as conventional, and they can, you can make a full-time um, living on, and you don't need 1,000 acres to survive. The average acreage in Iowa organic farms are about um, 300 acres. They also believe that livestock is essential for the compost and manure element. Uh, marketing the entire rotation, the small grains and hay, is still considered challenging. But if you have livestock, that makes it a lot easier. And if you have high food quality for your small grains, that makes it easier too. And there's, I think there's a couple of posters on that. And then just one final kudos to the current administration and all the people from USDA who have been so supportive of organic research. We wouldn't be here today without you, so thank you very much.